So one thing that struck me about your book was quite a bit of emphasis on Cochidius or folklore that might point to a memory of him, like the brown man of the moor and the, the mysterious figure in the chapel in Fergus of Galloway and so on. So I've known about Cochidius for a long time, of course, because I like the Old North, but I was really kind of lacking a point of reference for him until I read your book. So I wonder if you could talk a bit more about that, and I think maybe you've got some slides to go with that as well. I do, yes, I do. The figure of Cochidius is one who plays a pretty important part in, in the book because he's one of the few instances where you can say with a pretty high degree of certainty that there is solid evidence of the survival of the ancient Celtic tradition into the later years. And the reason for that is that this particular figure is one who we have a substantial body of archaeological evidence for him. We know a bit about what he presided over, which areas he was considered to be the deity of. And then there are multiple later strands of legend with some connections to those particular places in which a figure recurs who looks quite a lot like Cachidius, who plays a similar function as the guardian of the wilds and as this threatening figure. Although it may seem extraordinary, although it may seem somewhat far-fetched, almost too good to be true, that this ancient mythology could survive in a, a very complete form, the alternative explanation is actually far less likely because the alternative requires that multiple instances of fabulation, coincidence, fluke should have occurred in very, very large numbers to create something remarkably similar each time without there being a solid chain of connection. So for this particular figure, the fact that you can see that, the fact that there is such a large body of folklore to connect to him. The fact that you can trace that connection, it actually shows that it's not unreasonable to make that kind of connection. If it can happen with one, then it can very easily happen with others. So the journey looking for Cachidius starts off from Carlisle. Carlisle's important because it was the principal Roman city on the wall and certainly uh, the principal Roman city in the western side of, of Hadrian's Wall. It features quite heavily in Arthurian literature as the site of one of Arthur's capital cities. And it's this position that it fulfills in a number of northern tales that connect that particular deity. It is incidentally today also the location of the Tully House Museum where you can see quite a few of the ancient representations of Cachidius that remain to us. This here is the city of Carlisle itself, and this broken line is the line of Hadrian's Wall here, the northernmost frontier of the Roman Empire for many, many centuries. So to the south was the province of Britannia, and to the north were the unconquered tribes of the north. The large red names are three of the tribal names of the region, the Brigantes, a large tribal grouping who occupied the Pennine region, the Selgabi, a name meaning the hunters um, from the western side of the region north of the wall, and the Votadini, whose territory stretched right across the southeast of Scotland and the northeast of England. The red dots mark locations where there are inscriptions to Cachidius. There's one from Lancaster to the south of the map that I've not shown. The rest of them are the remaining archaeological records of the deity Cachidius. There is a large number of inscriptions to be found at some of the sites. They're particularly concentrated in the region around this set of hills in the centre here, the Bewcastle Fells, and particularly within even that region, this location here, this is Bewcastle itself um, in Roman times, it was fan, called Fano Cody, meaning shrine to Cachidius. This deity is therefore one whom we have a lot of archaeological evidence for, a lot of connections to this particular region that I went on to explore in the book. And this is an image that is likely to represent him, and it does a fantastic job of conveying the essence of the beast. Because a beast is very much what he was. This is a deity of the wilderness who himself represented the wilderness. He was the, the lord of the beasts. That's a term that people with an interest in Celtic mythology will be more accustomed to hearing used to describe Kernunos, who's the antlered 
Lord of the Beasts found in Gaul and to a lesser extent in southern Britain. In the north, that role is, fu is fulfilled by Cicidius, who is also a horn god, but with ram's horns rather than stag's antlers. And this particular image is not definitively him. It's not accompanied by an inscription, but it comes from within a region where the god of the wilderness is Cicidius. And Cicidius is himself shown in plaques that clearly are dedicated to him as a horned god. So we may reasonably infer that this is who this represents. As you can see, he's a fearsome creature. This was a wilderness guardian who was violent and hostile in nature. There's not a lot of gentleness here, and that's very, very consistent with the character of the wilderness in the north itself. It's not a place you would venture into lightly, a place where the climate is hostile, where it becomes cold, where you can perish even today with the benefit of modern hiking gear surprisingly easily. In ancient times, that same wilderness was inhabited by boar, by bears. The quality of equipment for venturing into it far, far inferior to what we have today. A place which contained death in all manner of forms, so it is only natural that it should be a scary one. Heading north from Carlisle on a journey looking for this god, a number of narratives take us through a particular place, a sacred site, where there's a castle to the maidens erected. I attempted to trace some of these, and it was a journey that led through this particular location. You can see here, this is Arthuret Parish Church. This particular site was dedicated to St. Michael the Archangel at an early date. This stone in the foreground you can see here dates back to the Kingdom of Strathclyde. So we're talking before Scotland or England even existed. This was a holy place. The dedication to St. Michael is revealing because he was the slayer of demons. And in the Celtic tr Christian tradition, pagan sites that were converted from temples into Christian churches were often dedicated to St. Michael. This place is a likely candidate. A few miles up the road from it, there's to be found this place. To capture it in a photograph is difficult because... It is today a series of enormous mounds of earth covered over with an incipient wildwood. But beneath these trees and in the shapes that you can see in the, the earth here, there are a series of absolutely monumental earthworks. And this is the remain of, remains of what is called little strength. This fortress again appears in a number of legends as the place from which a series of quests into a deep forest to a mysterious mountain seeking after a holy spring, a little temple, a place where treasures were to be found occur. And just after this site, in that forest, in a number of the tales, a supernatural wilderness guardian is encountered. So the journey I undertook in the book was to pass on through these landscapes, rich in archaeology, and then into that forest, into the woods that exist there now, and into the hill country that surrounds it, in search of the locations that those legends were either originally set in or to which they were later inserted. It seems clear to me that there was an original geography that the stories were intended to connect to. And in the course of the violent history of the borderland, that the names of those locations have been lost to us. That the formation of England and Scotland resulted in the destruction of an older historical heritage, which had a more profound connection to, to that older mythology. So into the mist and the woods we go. And in those woods and in the, the wild places, there are quite a few little secrets waiting to be found. This little shot is a shrine to Cicidius from the eastern side of the Cheviot Moors. This was discovered in 1980, believe it or not. This little chamber is a shrine chamber in which offerings were originally made. as a little altar at the back. And a carving here in the surface of the rock in the Romano-British tradition of the god himself. This is one example of such a shrine that has been found. It is my belief there are a great many more. And the tales from the eastern end of the Cheviots that indicate people venturing into that wilderness and encountering a being that looks like this deity are a sign that that kind of complex is to be found elsewhere. This is a particular candidate for a sacred place. This is the, the Kielder Stone in the central Cheviots. And in the course of my journey up on the moors in the Bewcastle Fells, I passed across a range of potential sites. This is the mound known as Marvin's Pike, and the Curricks to be found there, and further across the moorland, 
There's a very, very sizable complex of stonework, the origin of which is entirely unexplained. Now, several legends suggest that there is a place in the forest where a god, a wilderness guardian deity resembling Cicadius resides and can be encountered. And in one particular tale, one called Fergus, there is a stone chapel which is located on top of a mountain called the Nauquatran that, in my view, can be located with a reasonable degree of likelihood to the top of this particular summit you're looking at now. This is Glen Du Hill. And here, there is clearly something quite extraordinary. This particular tower, here of the left hand most one, stands about three times the height of a person. The others, two of them at least, stand taller than the average man. And there's a large, large amount of worked stone being used in the construction of them. The likely source is this little structure that you can see here in the foregrounds. And this is the tumbled remains of something that was once a much larger stone complex. And precisely what it is, is utterly unclear. There's no solid history to explain this structure, why something so large should be in this, this remote corner of Moor. And um, it's been visited only once by an archaeological surveyor who simply had no idea what it was. All he wrote down was the remains of an odd shaped building. And upon examining it and looking at it in the light of the legends that relate to this stretch of hill, I believe that there is a very, very strong chance that what this represents is actually a temple complex, likely dedicated to Cicidius, but also potentially to a number of other related spirits that continued in use far, far later than the present span accorded to the pre-Christian religion. I think this is potentially one of the latest pagan ritual sites in Britain. And in the book, that's explored in far more detail. The extent to which I can tell the stories that lead to that conclusion is limited by the sheer fact that there are so many stories that lead there. The book attempts to do that properly. It attempts to do it in an accessible, readable, enjoyable fashion that will guide you through four, five stories connected to the Cicidius cult and illuminate what is a truly striking survival of something that is not meant to have survived. It opens up some very, very strong possibilities in the history of Britain and potentially makes this landscape we've been exploring a far more fascinating thing than we've ever thought it was. I think you make a very convincing argument and I recommend the book, absolutely, because there are points where you just think, oh, the hair kind of stands up on the back of your neck when you read it, and it must have been similar for you when you were finding these different pieces of evidence. I even bought a copy of Fergus of Galloway, although I haven't read it yet. <laughs> it's, a, it's a striking text. Fergus really does deserve a bit of going through. For a patriotic Scotsman, it's actually brutal because oh, yeah. it was created by what was effectively a, a colonial elite, a francophone aristocracy who were looking to justify their own rule over the, the Celtic natives. And some of the humour and the really quite cruel way that it depicts the native culture is uncomfortable. But in its depiction of that native culture and in savaging it, it attacks things that there isn't any evidence for any, anywhere else. And the only reason it's attacking them is because they were part of the cultural continuum that existed, otherwise they wouldn't be in there. And you can draw very clear parallels between the material that's in Fergus and a lot of Arthurian texts to the extent that the author has clearly just directly lifted it. And the fact that that's the creative method that's been adopted, that it is the wholesale appropriation of pre-existing tradition for political purposes, in a number of instances, we can verify this clearly because we know what the source texts are, also makes it very likely that that's what's happened in other sections of Fergus where we don't have source texts for it. The only reason that the tales that are presented in the form that they are is the appropriation of native tradition and its use for the denigration of that tradition. And by attacking that tradition in the fashion it has, it's actually inadvertently, in my view, ended up preserving traces of legends that have otherwise been lost, some of which are really exciting. 
And I try and explore that a little bit in the book. But I do believe that there is more mileage in Ferris, and it is horrible. But wade through it nonetheless. I look forward to doing that when I when I find the time to wade through it because it's a bit of a monster. In chapter eight of your book, in particular, you offer a number of arguments for the survival of pre-Christian religion. Quite mm. a few centuries into the post-Roman period, mm. quite a few centuries into the post-Roman period at times. Now, I admit, yeah. I think along the same lines, but you you seem really passionate about finding evidence for this. And I guess my question is, why do you consider it important to prove it? What would it change for you if the evidence was more tangible? The sense that I have is that we live in a place that housed what was once one of the most utterly fascinating civilizations that has existed on this planet. And it's a civilization that has inspired some of the most extraordinary and wonderful works of literature, of fiction, of, of legend, that have created this really powerful wellspring of, of ideas. And the notion of this pagan civilization continuing after the Roman era is one that crops up time and again in the imaginations of, of authors and writers who look back at, at that era. It has inspired some really compelling and wonderful pieces of literary imagination. And I actually have come to believe on examining the, the evidence that this is not an exercise of imagination, that that absolutely fascinating little dream that's inspired so many people existed. There are some fairly wild ideas out there, so perhaps not quite everything <laughs> everyone can think it can be. But it, it was something truly extraordinary and something which influenced the course of European civilization in an enormous number of ways and which was at one time a genuine competitor for the soul of Europe, a whole other model that civilization could have followed. And the fact that that existed and that my ancestors made that and that it's the memory of it has effectively been eaten out of existence angers me. And the fact that there is this wonderful, fascinating civilization that exists that is the relics of which are to be found all over the hills that I visit all the time, just so close to my, my own door. I find thrilling beyond belief the notion that there is a lost civilization, one of the finest, just around the corner, ready to be explored, is one of the best adventures that could be promised to someone like me anyway. My own educational background was in anthropology originally back at university. And so I cut my teeth in looking at how societies and civilizations evolve. And the anthropological tradition, anthropological literature, recognizes that there are certain processes by which change occurs. There are intermediate stages, there are folk traditions that will typically survive longer than, than elite traditions. And these are recognizable enough that there are actually technical terms for them in anthropology. They're not outlandish or wild. They are just what you would expect to find because that is exactly what you find every time that you look at a society where some kind of religious or cultural change has occurred. And our scholarship that we have at the moment when it comes to looking back at the past is so devoted to the idea of scepticism that it actually doesn't learn the lessons that have been taught by other disciplines, by other academic schools. If you take an interdisciplinary perspective, the notions I'm pushing in my book that it that folk practices in the borderland region do actually represent the direct continuity of pre-Christian religion. That wouldn't seem crazy at all. That's something that absolutely happens in a multitude of the societies I studied in anthropology. But in the tradition of Celtic studies discourse, to see something like that, such a, a broad, clear, definitive statement would fly in the face of a tradition of scepticism that has evolved for the best of intentions, but which has led to criticism of what the field might call unscholarly speculation, but which in other scholarly fields wouldn't. If scholars can do it in one field, I don't think it's unscholarly to do it in others. And that interpretive barrier is one that I am keen to break down because I think that there are a great many extremely 
talented academic minds who are being limited from exploring all the data that's available out there. And we could do a better job of exploring the past and exploring this wonderful civilization that inspires all of us. And I think that we need to improve the methods for that. And so part of what has energized me in this pursuit is to show people how wonderful it is and to try to break down some of the barriers that have prevented people from exploring its fully as they might. Well, I think those barriers definitely exist and we could dissect the religious and ethnic and uh, class reasons for some of that. <laughs> But we would, again, be here all night, I think. We just have to recognize that they do exist, and I think they're being broken down a little slowly by the generation that's studying in university right now. I think that we could find better ways of communicating with people who don't know as much as the experts. I've got plenty of learning left to do. I would love for some of those experts to communicate with me better and to fill in the gaps in, in my knowledge and for us to be able to create stories out of that that would help to inspire others and guide more people along to inquiring into this. Yeah, I think Celtic studies in particular need to do a better job of outreach. Yeah, archaeology does a really good job of that now. Uh, community outreach and that kind of thing. Uh, Celtic studies, it's very inward looking. It's not going to help their funding any, you know, with the funding for humanities being so poor now. Mm. Anyway, there needs to be outreach to people. There's massive curiosity about Celtic material now, Celtic texts and Celtic religion, mm. all that kind of stuff. And people aren't getting fed the latest things in an accessible way. In fact, sometimes they're not fed it at all because it's behind a paywall. I would quite like to collaborate with other people from all kinds of, of walks of life with all sorts mm -hmm. of skill sets with an interest in the subject matter to, to try and find some new ways of communicating these stories to a wider audience. So I guess that's the next step beyond the book that I've, I've published, to try and find others and work together to, to bring these stories alive in the, the best possible way that we can. So um, where can people find you and how can they buy your book? Um, if anybody does wish to, to get in touch to look at the book, or if you have shared interests and you would like to try and pitch some kind of collaboration, do, please. Uh, the place to come to it's uh, www.inter-celtic.com. Um, so I-N-T-E-R-Celtic.com. The details of the book are on there. It is The Ghost of the Forest, The Lost Mythology of the North. You can access that through Amazon. If you are in the UK, you can get it as an ebook anywhere in the world through Amazon again. Um, through my own website, which would be fantastic if you buy through that. It's available in both the United States and in the UK. At some point, a wider geographical rollout will occur, but I have to get my head around lots of international tax systems. Well, I have one or two friends now in the US who've told me they've gotten a hard copy from you from your website and it arrived and they were happy. So <laughs> the system is working. It takes a little bit longer to get there and the, the cost of the, the postage is a bit higher than I would ideally like. But Bill Young, it's been really enjoyable chatting with you and I appreciate you taking the time for this conversation and for sharing your photos and your stories with us. Thank you very much for having me, Chris.